What's up, everybody? This is Plexus Coburus, and I'm catching a moment with my main man, David Tyree. Eli Manning stays on his feet. It is caught by Tyree. Welcome back to Catch the Moment. It's your boy, David Tyree. Hey, back with another one. Got no other than this is family right here again. I call him the most dominant wide receiver in New York Giants history. We'll talk a little bit about how I came to that conclusion. Plax, what's good, my boy? What's going on, man? What's happening? Yeah, man. That's that's what that's exactly what I what I came here for. What's going What's going on, man? <laughs> well, listen, man. I appreciate you. You know, just taking some time to kick it with me. Totally enjoy the conversation with the pivot. But um, hey, listen, man. That's what we're doing here. We're just talking a little bit of life process journey. Obviously, we shared a good a good portion of our life journey together, ball in New York. But um, I mean, just to kick it off, bro. Like, um, the funnest part about this is, man, like having conversation with friends. And I'm like, man, when I think about our relationship through the years, there was always this this mutual respect. But then I also thought, like, when I hear you talk about VA, <laughs> it's like me talking about Jersey and Montclair. You know, now. I heard the laundry list going out of coming out of VA on, on the pivot, but we also had some other similarities. We're like, you know, we both lost our moms. We both got amazing wives. That's like, whew, man. Well, we wouldn't be here without them, <laughs> bruh. And um, and and obviously, we both had different legal incidents as well. So, but but I wanted you to you know kind of give me a little you know like I have a we have we have a crazy amount of respect for each other own relationship but start off I didn't know really fully know about you know your journey in, in Virginia I know know about Virginia Beach but tell me about mom's life in Virginia Beach just kind of paint that picture and what developed your pedigree oh man it's uh you know I think I just had this I had just had this uh you know conversation with my son the other day mm you know, so we you know we riding around. We got kids. Our kids got activities. We taking me to this trainer and that trainer, soccer and football. And I told my son, I was like, man, when I was growing up, we didn't have trainers. <laughs> Going outside in the house, that, that was your trainer. <laughs> either Real you talk. Could, either you could play, or you stayed in the house. Or you stayed in the crib. And um, I, I just look back on, uh, you know, what how I grew up and where I came from. And, um, you know, my mom just going from, you know, like Section 8 housing to Section 8 housing to, I think I went through like six different elementary schools by the time I was 12. Really? So, you know, just changing neighborhood, neighborhood, neighborhood. And, um, you know, I, I always, you know, I kind of, you know, I held that, you know, close to me because that, that really shaped my my foundation athletically because it was just, it was just so competitive. Mm. And growing up in Virginia Beach, you know, um, you know, we had we had fairly good weather, so we could basically basically, you know, play you know f football, basketball, and baseball all year round because we did. I think I think I saw snow twice. Oh wow! You know, growing up the whole time I was, you know, I'm actually surprised by that a little bit. All right. Yeah, yeah. It, it, the weather was, wasn't that crazy, you know, uh, you know, 30 years ago. But uh, you know, I look at you know uh, some of the guys that I that I grew up with went to school with and played with. And you, man, listen, there, there were guys that were actually better than me. See, that's that, one of my that, things. <laughs> that didn't get the opportunity or, you know, they made it, they made it wrong, they made it right when they're supposed to make a left. There you go. And we all know how that story goes and, you know, those, those guys are, you know, play, playground legends is what we call there them. There we go. But I always, you know, uh, I always prided myself on um, like being better than them. And, you know, proving to everybody that I had a dream as a, a kid when I was seven years old to go to the NFL. And people thought I was crazy because. You know, so no, at that's, seven? At seven, that's seven. So when did you start? Like, what was what, what was the passion sport? What, did it start with football immediately? Nope, the first sport I played was baseball, believe it or not. Bro, that, get out of here. That's crazy. Was, that's back when black no, people I still was, played baseball. Listen, listen, I was a crazy baseball player, man. Believe it or not, I played left field and first base. And um, my junior, my my junior, and junior high class, junior high, we won a city championship. Oh. I get to Green Run High School in Virginia Beach. I'm a freshman. I'm starting right field. I'm starting right field as a freshman on our on our varsity baseball team, and our high school goes on to win 
three state championships in baseball. So that's how good our team was in the state of Virginia. That's tight. And um, so my freshman year, I'm basically standing out there in right field, my, and my football coach comes up and says, hey, man, why are you over here playing baseball? You need to be on the track working on your, working on your stride. Working, <laughs> working on so I quit baseball, and I, and, and I stopped playing. And, um, you know, I just went, you know, I, I just went from there to start playing football. And a lot of people know, man, I, basketball was like my true love. Okay. And um, I love basketball more than anything. My sophomore year, I walked out of uh, training camp. I was like, man, I quit. I don't play football no more. So I was basically just saying that, you know what, I want to play basketball. And I wanted to go to the NFL, but it was like – I was like this long, gangly kid. I was like 6'5", yeah. 185 pounds. And I was like, back then, I was like, man, ain't nobody playing no football at no 6'5", 185 pounds. Only only linemen. It was a few, you know, it's always a few freaks, you know, like Al Toon in the world or something yeah. like that. It was like, yeah, rare, rare. Yeah, so, so, obviously, so tell me like, because, you know, like that part in relation, I didn't know that your mom had passed away, was it 99, 2000? No, my mom passed away in March of 02 after going okay. to my third my second season after my second season okay yes yeah, so I didn't know it was that early in your career you know yeah. me losing my mom when I lost my mom you was there for that but like what what about your relationship with your mom what did she cement in you that kind of laid some of your foundation because I know how special she was I never got a chance to meet her but what's what's the most impressionable thing that you know that you take away with that you still hold fast to she was just she was just so strong, man. Yeah. And, and being a child, you don't even re- recognize and understand it until you get to where we are now. Mm. Sacrifices that she made, and and she would tell you, she would say something to you, and you believed it. Mm. You believed it after you know sitting there and watching her go about the way that she carried herself and how she went from job to job or whatever just to. You know, uh, to defeat us basically. Yeah, and you believed it because you you watched her like defy the odds and just keep fighting, keep grinding to the point to where, like, we didn't have much, but we didn't need we didn't we didn't need nothing either. That's the, you know? See, that's the beautiful thing. Yeah, and most people don't get that. Like sometimes when you poor, you don't even know you poor. It's like yeah. or. You know, when you're missing something, you don't even know you're missing something. Right. But until right. you, you know, you grow up, you mature. So, 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 you know, like I'm gonna give you, the, I'm gonna give you this platform on, on the like, when did things really start to click? You know, obviously it was a lot of, like I said, I, I'm hearing the names, the Iversons. I was the Ron Curry uh, graduating class, number one in both sports. So I know, I know the energy has to be crazy, and and just as far as. So, but when did when did things click from you from the standpoint when you realize <laughs> my dreams are starting to become a reality even in relation to going D one? Man, um, you know what? I was a sophomore in high school, and this is crazy. So after the last day of school, on my freshman year, me and my boys we 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 skipped school and we went to another high school, uh, Tallwood in Chesapeake, and we got caught. <laughs> got, yeah, got him. I get back to school. My coach say, "Man, you six five. You can't hide in the hallway walking around. You got to be the craziest person in the world." So, so long and behold, the, uh, my high school football coach is, my, is the uh, ISS coordinator. So, okay. you know, I get the I get ISS on the first day of school. That's, that's got to be some kind of detention or something yeah, like that. It, it's right. like in school suspension. I bet. Like, like we outside the portable. And it's the first day of school. It's just me and him. And man, he wore me out for about for about from seven o'clock in the morning to two thirty in the afternoon. Drills and, um, like just no, no, just, just on you. Just like, man, look 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 where you at. It's the first day of school, your sophomore year, <laughs> and you and I says. And he came from behind the desk and he put this like this one that U.S. mail postage yeah. white bucket in front of me. He said, "Man, open those up and start reading." Them. And I said, "Man, what's that, man?" And when I looked in that bucket, I was, what, 16 years old? And there was already every college in the country in that bucket. And I was only and I was only 16 years old. Wow, bro. I mean, Notre Dame, Florida State, Virginia, Clemson, Kansas. So you never saw it before that? I never saw the letters before that. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, hold on, man. So you mean to tell me they think I'm good enough to go to college? 
He was like, I'm telling you, that's what it is right there. So that that right there, though, it, it played a it played a ill, you know, part on me, and um, and in a, in a, in another incident, I remember. I mean, you, you thinking about the talent we had? We had Joe Smith was number one pick. Yeah. Um, you know, playing against Joe, playing against AI. Yeah. And I realized I wasn't that good of a basketball player. We ended up playing against Aaron Brooks <laughs> at Ferguson High School and Newport News. And, you know, I said, I just I want to guard Aaron Brooks. He was like a McDonald's All American. I and, remember Aaron Brooks. And he scored 26 points. So, man, I was like, yeah. <laughs> Yo, he dogged me up. He dogged me. They UVA. He was actually, I don't know if he was my host at UVA, but he was right. He was, I was definitely kicking it with AB. Yeah. It was special. He dogged me, man. <laughs> like, I mean, I couldn't guard him. And I was like, yo, this man is really nice. And, That's um, crazy. you know, you, you fast forward and you get to the to what you're talking about. Um, I remember the, the first day of school, my senior year, I saw him go to my senior year. And I go to school, and on the marquee, they have. Black like Skill Burns, first team All American. Yeah. Scholastic like Sports All American, Parade All American. And I walk in the door, and my high school coach is there, standing there. He said, Come here, put me to the side. And he, he hand me, I'm like, What's this? He give me a plane ticket. Okay. Right? And it's to go to Gainesville to watch the University of Florida versus Tennessee. Peyton Man is coaching, Rita Hill, nice. Fred T. Vaughn. You know, all of those guys. And my senior year, I was number one wide receiver in the country before the season started. Absolutely. Deservedly so. And then he pulled out my report card. <laughs> <laughs> Last in the country. <laughs> Last in the country. My report card said, Eddie. Eddie. Like e D D E D. Your report card had a name, huh? My report had a name. And, um, he said to me, he said, you know what, man? He said, you're the number one wide receiver in the country. But right now, you can't go to college. You can't go nowhere. Bro. So so I want you to go see this. I had never been on a plane. Yeah. I had never left the state of Virginia. And I get down to Gainesville. My uncle picks me up from the airport. And we stop at just like a regular, like a tiny john or whatever you want yeah. to call it. And I get out of the car, and these kids are like, hey, Black Skull, you coming to school? I'm like, how, how y'all know my name? <laughs> I'm like, y'all know me? I'm, I'm, this is back in the day. This ain't the internet yeah, popping like that. Man, we're in Virginia. That's crazy. And so I go to this game, man. And it's like the, I don't know, it's like the first game of the season. Man, I walk in this stadium, and I, I was just, you see 85,000 people. And you see all it, and it, it players running on the field, and my heart like jump out my chest, like oh, I'm sure. So I had to be at the swamp, right? It was at the swamp, yeah, because because even back then, uh, so, Tennessee had a crazy big stadium. So I walked down. I mean, I had never been in like a stadium, but nothing like that. I was 18, and I walked on the field, and I remember you know looking at Steve Spurrier, and I'm like, Coach, so you mean to tell me <laughs> that if I go to college and play football. I said, oh, these people going to show up every Saturday. He said, they're going to be right here waiting on you. I said, yeah, I got to get myself together. <laughs> That's a bar yeah, right there, man. Yeah. That's a street. I, I went back home. I got back home Sunday. My coach picked me up from the airport. And he said, uh, he said what you think? I said, I'm going to college. Bruh. And I got back to school, and I made the honor roll for the rest of the year. So that was just me telling myself that it wasn't the point that I couldn't do it. It's the fact that I was just being lazy. And I think a lot of us realize that at different, different, different levels and different stages, that's a, that's a bar right there. But, but, you know, it always reminds me of like, you know, if you see it, you can believe it and have it vision. And most of us, that's actually what we needed. I, I kind of talk about my transition moving from young, but I'm still moving from East Orange to Montclair. And most people don't know. You know, everybody gets the diversity thing, but I'm like, it was, it was some real people in Montclair, but it, it still gave me vision for a future that I couldn't have. So this is another interesting piece to me that I, th I think is pretty dope um, in, in your story. Like, when it, when I come to how amazing your, your your journey was, like, you 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 are arguably the most dominant in your era at every level, right? So 
but your coaching tree is is kind of legendary, right? Like you you at Michigan State with Saban, right? Yeah. Same. Then you got Cowher in Pittsburgh, mm-hmm. Coughlin in, in New York, and it, it was it was it Rex over there? Oh, yeah, Rex and Mike T. <laughs> So not legendary, but rock rock solid, and, and still got his own legend. But and then Mike T. Yeah. So all right, so I gotta ask you this question: Who was the most impactful coach, and why? Uh, I gotta say, Coach Cow. Okay, talk to me. Because um, even though we we all know that's a business, and you, you understand that as a kid going in, it's a it's a performance driven business. Mm-hmm. And he drafted me in 2000. I was Kevin Colbert's first pick. We had, everybody had basically all got there at the same time. Got it. And and I don't not one time did he ever make me feel let me feel like it was a business. He, mm. he, 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 it, our relationship was it was almost like a, a, a son coach kind of uh, relationship. Wow. And he never made me feel like a player. That's why I was all. That was that's why it was so easy for a guy like myself. Yeah, and a lot of people to play for him because he didn't make you feel like a player. He was always asking questions. He's like, Yo, "How do you feel? Um, how are the guys feeling? What's the morale?" Wow. And he'd be like, "Coach, man, we tired." And he'd be like, "All right, he'll call up practice. Man. All right, everybody, go home and come back tomorrow." Bro, <laughs> that's gold. I yeah, never yeah, would. Yeah. I never looking at him from the outside in. I would never. Oh get man, that. He, no, he had that the whole that gr- scowl and spit <laughs> that Sergeant time Slaughter grill, you know, <laughs> and all of that, you know, going on, man. And um, he was just a coach to where, listen, it, it, you never had to ask where you was at with him uh-huh. because it was all about it was about football, it was about the team and about football and everything outside of the building. They expected for you to act like a professional because, like, listen, we not. Covering anything else. Yeah, absolutely. Like when you're inside this building, it's about winning. It's about you know treating people with respect and just playing hard for your teammates. It's beautiful. And, and he never, like I said, man, I always felt like I could just walk in the room and talk to him about anything. It's tight. And listen, if he was upset with you, he would let you know. Oof. But he would always, you know, pull you to the side. And you know, I remember. <laughs> You know, and, and you know what? He he, he never find me. He never find a player in his whole career. So I see why you would struggle when yeah. you come over there. That's right. Oh, oh my God. Yeah, I'm like, yo, man, what's going on, man? I've been doing this all day long over there, man. What's happening? Bro, that's crazy. All right, so just on the, real quick, on the flip side, what was your worst experience, even though these are all amazing coaches, but who? what was the worst experience with? With, with who? Well, from your coaches, from these head coaches. Oh, t- t- uh, Tom Coffey. One hundred percent. It's not even close. It's not even close. And one particular incident, or well, two. It was. A, well, it was. It was a three. It was I, enough of them. Give, I, give, give me the most iconic. I, I, I'm, I'm gonna give you the most iconic one. I get to. I get the jersey. It's my first mini camp. You know, buzzes, everything is going on. And this is this so, is this is braided yeah, up, iconic, yeah, you know, so iconic braids, black I come in here with all my gear. I got my blue tights. I got my white shirt. <laughs> you know, I got all this stuff going on. And uh, I remember uh, Will Will Pete come up and said, "What you doing?" I said, "What you mean? I'm, I'm getting ready to go to practice." He said, "You can't wear that." <laughs> oh man, you tripping? You can't wear that. Hundred percent. So I take my jersey. I cut my jersey up. You know, I got all that, all this showing. I, I cut the cut it down the middle. I got my white sleeves on, and straight hand started laughing. <laughs> I said, "Yo, man, what's up?" He was like, "Can't wear that." I was like, "Man, whatever, man. We're going to practice, man. What, what's the little AI moment, little practice, man. It's practice, man." So I get out the power run on the field, and before I can get on the field, it's like, "Scoot, hey, come, hey, come here." I'm like, oh, "What's the problem, coach?" He said, uh, where'd you get this stuff from? I was like, what you mean? It's mine. <laughs> he was like, uh, you can only wear giant issue uni- giant issue equipment. I'm like, yeah. And you can't alter your uniform. I said, what you mean all this? Yeah. I, 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 I just cut my jersey. TC style. And, and, and he said, uh, he said, uh, he said, listen, I know you could do anything you want to do when you're in Pittsburgh, but you can't do those things here. <laughs> 
<laughs> it's a pair of tights and a shirt. Like, what are we talking about? Uh, and I knew right then. And then we started running. And they was like, Bud make me chin strap. I'm like, oh, yeah. For what? All that, bro. We ain't going nowhere. <laughs> Bud make my chin strap. All to that. To run up and down. No, that's not going to happen either. <laughs> mm-hmm. well, that, that, that must have been the beginning. That was the beginning right there. But obviously, I had, I had front row seats, man. But I, I had to. <laughs> Bro, that was, I'm going to tell you my funniest moment, and I don't know if it was, I felt like it was It was on an away trip, and we had a snowstorm, and <laughs> bro, so you had already had a handful of TC incidents, bro, yeah. and, and you know, we we supposed to be literally mar- marching our way to a plane, I'm pretty sure, and, and plaques ain't here, I mean, Lord knows we can't lead the, <laughs> lead the show without plaques, and bro, I'm looking out the window. I see an F-250 rolling up. There's an F-650. F-650? Yeah, Bro, I see that F-650 rolling up, and I'm like, oh, this man here is different. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this man here. I got the biggest truck in the state of New Jersey. <laughs> but the thing about it was, I can't get out my driveway. Listen. Because I'm way up on the hill, and you can't come down that driveway on the snow and ice. But, yeah, I remember pulling up with the X-650, and everybody would laugh. I'm like, yo, dog, come on. Man, that thing was special, bro. <laughs> I said, hey, I can't make it. It's snowing. <laughs> All right, fam. So, you know, I say you're the most dominant receiver in Giants history. I use that word. Imani had the longevity records and all that stuff. But honestly, it was it was for a number of reasons. Um, I mean, the most obvious is not practicing the whole daggone <laughs> year of the Super Bowl run and playing at the level that you played at was one of the most astronomical feats. My question like amongst that era, and I know it wasn't a cookie cutter 13 season, but it's still an amazing timeline of amongst that era and your receiver, who 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 was the most dominant? I know that you're the most dominant. You know, yeah, you you playing amongst Randy. I know that's a that's that stratosphere, but there's not dominant is different than you know, good and prolific. So, you know, who are some of those guys that you respect amongst our time, our era? And you know, like I'm, I'm, you're right in there in that conversation. Um, I never really thought about you know dominant versus you know greatness. Yeah. Um, man, I came in an era to where you know To was dominant. Mm-hmm. That's dominant. Um, <laughs> you know, I look at guys like Jimmy Smith. Ooh, dominant. man, that's a name that doesn't come up too often. Respect. Jimmy Smith, dominant. Um, such a, a a little a little cat that had big time game with Steve Smith. Steve before Smith before he broke his leg it was just he was out cold. He dominant, <laughs> unbelievable. Um, Andre Johnson dominant, agreeable. Um, it's a lot, man. Listen, Tory Holt, you know <laughs> Isaac Bruce, all of those guys. But I, I think when it came to if you put one guy on the edge, yeah. And you you ask this guy, listen, when you're in a man to man situation, we want you to win basically ten out of ten times. Yeah. And when I when I look at it that way, um, you know, for a guy like like me, myself, I know even when I was in Pittsburgh, man, it was it was the it was the same thing. Yeah. And you know I, that's one of the reasons why you know Hans he was catching a hundred hundred balls. He was he was getting. A year. And you know I, I didn't want to leave Pittsburgh, but you know like I guess the business side of it got on, and I ended up you know coming to New York, and it kind of like fed my fuel, you know a little bit more because they was they were saying that you know I couldn't dominate and I couldn't be a true one, bro. And and but you know you have to realize that. When I was a Pittsburgh man, you know, it was a different generation. It was. You know, we had, you know, Jerome Bettis, he was getting the ball 30 times a game. Different ball. You know, we were going to have 55 to 60 plays. I yeah. was going to get five or six attempts. Hines was going to get his five or six. Yeah. And we were going to spread it around. So, yeah. I had never had the ball thrown to me 10 times in a game. Yeah. The targets, yeah. I mean, just the targets. It's crazy to see the targets some of these modern players are getting. Yeah. It's out of control. So when I came to New York, I was like, man, I'm getting 13, 14 targets a game. I said, <laughs> like, yo, they in trouble. Bro. And, and, and then, you know, I kind of felt to where, like, 
I was, you know, I was understanding, but again, I understand. I said, listen, if I'm not, if I'm not at my best, then my offense is is not going to be what we're supposed to be. Yeah. And I started taking it personal. It's good. Personal every, you know, uh, Sunday to go out and dominate. Yeah, I'm going to tell you, from the outside looking in, and, and of course, you know, everybody's in there competing, everybody believes, but when you see somebody like yourself sh show up, you know, and even like, you know, respect to AT and Monty Toomer, it's like, some guys, you just got to acknowledge. I, I think my superpower was freaking self-awareness. I knew I was good enough to play and, and contribute, but I'm like, I got to do something real extra to get some attention, right? So the most the most impressive thing that I saw you do was just honestly get better, even though you were still really 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 good because from a guy like me i'm like the one he can drop a pass and ain't nobody going i drop a pass i look bad you know and, and reality, I, you know it's not like i had like you know super grips but i saw you know like that first year with the team I'm like it was some plays that 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 you let go but it i, I felt like i never saw it again that, that after 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 that first season i think it was 05 was your first year with us yeah. i'm like this dude just got more better and better and better. So what do you think was your superpower? I would even ask you, this is something I like to ask every guest, what is your signature, you know, I'll ask you both questions. What's your, what was your, the thing that set you apart and what was your defining moment that you felt like throughout your football career? Uh, I think that my game was able to flourish and go to a different level because I was beginning to understand the concept of, of a total defense. Mm. What the defense was doing to me, what they were giving to me, what they were trying to take away. And and I wanted to put myself in a position to where I was going to do it anyway, even though they were taking it away from me. And and the obviously was don't think that way. Yeah. And they want to run away from it. Like, I would get inside man trail. I know I got to dig. Absolutely. And the easy route is to just go outside, get to the top, yep. and try to beat them across the face. I wanted to go inside, like, off the line of scrimmage to fight them to get in there. So, because if I could get in there and I wasn't supposed to get in there, I know the coach was going to be getting in there. They cooking, boy. Hey, listen. Number one. <laughs> and, and I'm still doing what the defense is not letting me do. And it drove – defenses and people crazy that I was able to to you know process that I'm like you know what I'm just gonna do it anyway right. and then you know me and Kevin Gilbride and <clears throat> like he started to understand OC that. big shout to OC he he started to understand that and he started giving me the leeway he said well listen if you're gonna do it that way it better work okay and then I was like okay yeah. That, ain't, that ain't no problem. I'm still, just, <laughs> I'm, still, listen, I'm still getting to my depth. I'm still getting to where I got to go. Absolutely. I just wasn't doing it the conventional way. I was doing it my way, and it was still, and, and it was the, the, the end result was what it was supposed to Yo, be. Y'all was getting that good home cooking. And he gave me. He was the first coach that I ever played for, offensive coordinator. Yeah. That he wasn't a he wasn't a screamer. Yeah, he was. He got to the point to where like he would talk to me. And he let me go about my my job based off my athletic ability. And he didn't put me in a box. And he was like, listen, if you're going to do it, yeah, it has to work. He was fantastic. He, he was fantastic. And even that year that won, yeah, it was, it, was, it, was, it was your first year with us. I, I won that third wide receiver yeah. coming out of camp. And, you know, it just didn't work out. They wanted the guys and, and, and you know, had some rough trips. And that was still a young emerging Eli yeah, at the was. same time, too. So, you know, bring me into what, what you think was – because you you did move from chess to checkers. And I don't know if that – I think more – I mean, like, you were dominant and, and balling in Pittsburgh. But it was clearly that emerging – like, you, you know, you, no. your, your mindset, your approach was different. So what about that – what you say is your defining moment? I figured out nobody could guard me one on one, and that was the that'll ball, do. And that was the ball game. <laughs> that'll do. I think once I once I found that out, and playing playing against everybody, yeah, like Champ, Charles Woodson, yeah, some monsters to uh, uh, what's my man uh, in uh, Green Bay. Um, oh, Al. Yeah, Al Harris. Once I got to the point to where I I figured out that you know I, I was playing a game one on one. And they were afraid of me, but I didn't. I didn't. I didn't know how much they were. 
Got it. Because they were like, nobody gotcha. wanted to be in a situation where they were playing one on one with me. Yeah. And I, 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 I kind of mastered getting off the line of scrimmage and bump and run to just basically just, you know, getting my shoulder, getting my foot, uh, you know, one foot upfield ahead of them. And I didn't have to be three or four yards ahead of them to be open. If I got a guy on my shoulder, yo, just give me the ball right here. Boom. I was open. And we and we actually made the phase stop like a play. Oh, and, absolutely. And, and it used to be an adjustment that we would make. Bad ball and, adjustment. And we actually started just calling it as a play. Yeah. And it drove people crazy because, listen, if I'm playing over the top. Cooked. It's all day. He's, he's coming back to get the ball. But if he gets over top of me. It's a, it's a home run. Absolutely. And um, once I once I started understanding man to man off the line of scrimmage, what what they what those cats could do. Yeah. It, it, it was like nobody wanted to play single high anymore. All right. So you got to give me. I want to hear what what was your what was you saying? I mean, like we obviously won the Super Bowl. You got the game winning touchdown, but you also had a lot of man, bro. You had a lot of accomplishments. So what was the signature moment for you throughout your career experience? As, as an athlete. <clears throat> Meaning the shining moment, bro. Signature moment. Um, I just, I got to say Green Bay. Man, I'm so, I, I'm I, so I, glad I, you said because it's I so easy to say the game with a touchdown, bro, but that's when I knew. I got to say Green Bay. That's when I said, we got, I don't care what nobody said. I mean, like you was already boss. That's what I said, we have the best receiver in the league this year from that performance. Meaning like, you, you uh, was good. You was good by me. Yeah. Uh, I remember, you know, going into that week, and uh, Sam was messing with me. Sam was like, hey, man, Al said, ain't going to shut you down. I was like, man, go ahead, man. I ain't got to hear that. So then I, I, remember, I remember the two, like the Tuesday, he got on, stood up on the podium and said, yeah, I'm going to shut him down if he come to Green Bay. I said, oh, so oh. You, see, I always miss the sound bites. I said, oh, <laughs> no. <laughs> me? <laughs> man. I broke him down so bad on film to the point to where when he stepped on the field and tied his shoe, it was already over with. Bro, but you might I as well think, got back there, and tied his man, locks up, man, ran routes around him, and then I think you know for that, you know, I had lost two, I had lost two AFC Championship games to go to the Super Bowl. Okay, that was my third championship game in seven years. See, I never think of this stuff. And I'm saying to myself, man. I know how bad those games hurt when you lose them. To be Ooh. right there staring at the door and you don't get to, you know, open it and see what's on the other side, losing those two championship games. I said to myself, I said, man, listen, I'm not I don't care what I gotta do tonight. I'm, yeah. I'm not losing this game and going back home. Bro, you can't and that, and that was some of the motivation too, because you know, I had a chance to go to three Super Bowls in like seven years. <sighs> but we ran yeah. in New England. Yeah, and I was like, I gotta get out of the AFC because ain't nobody beating them no time. So, so I came to the NFC and ended up running into them anyway. I will say you made some, that was that was a hell of a business decision. <laughs> hell of a business decision. Come on over to the. To, I'm grateful for it, man. So you know, I've always, like I said, we I've always had this solid mutual respect. And I'm I'm be honest with you, like you know, y'all everybody knows me in relation, like the, the the people who knew me knew me in relation to being a man of God, being a man of faith. But you never know the kind of impact. I always respect um, guys who are just the best at what they do. And um, I always had a good relationship with the guys in the room. And it was always solid. But, you know, we, we, got, we, we share something else in common. You got a piece of property that I feel like belongs to me and you feel like belongs to you. Yeah, well, I'm going to do this for the all people. Hey, listen, I mean, you know, we had the conversation once before, but I figured it, I, we got to have a little discussion. There's got to be some bartering. So, Plaxico has... The game-winning football from Super Bowl 42, which also has the imprint of the helmet catch. And, you know, just for the viewers out there, I got to, you know, I got to at least give us the opportunity. I think people need to vote on this. You know, it's kind of like Debo and Friday. Like, I, you know, we can be like both of us. When, when he finish talking, when he finish, when he leave, I'll be talking to you. <laughs> it can be like both of us. We just keep it at my house. Hey, you, know? Man, you know, you <laughs> know. I came home one day. I said, "Yo, man, where is the football at?" And my son said, "I took you to school for show and tell." And I said, "You know, you ain't allowed to do that." Ooh, Are you serious? We don't take this ball to your house. <laughs> show and tell. Show and tell. Tell him to turn on the TV or something. <laughs> mm -mm. 
Right. All right, so I'm going I'm to I'm I'm peel off that. I'm, I'm bringing it over here one day. <laughs> I'm bringing it over here. Yeah, man, we, 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 we got some, per- we, we feel some weight. We, we feel some kind of weight, but I totally understand. You earned it. So did I, but you earned it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm so, going to make sure I bring it over here for the people. So, bro, I want to, obviously, you know, I, it, was, it was a great conversation on the Pivot Podcast with the fellas. I want to hit it from a different angle, man, in relation to, um, you know, your, your, your experience with the gun charge. So, you know, the obvious is what the obvious is. You know, I really want to tap in because I want to be locked into the process, the journey and what you grew through and how you learned. Mentally and emotionally, what kept you together from start to finish? Throughout, you know, you talk about really about two two plus years from the incident mm-hmm. o- over a three year period. What kept you together and, and during that roller coaster? Man, it was a lot. It, it was a lot. It was a lot to digest yeah. know, during that time and um, try to figure out why and mm-hmm. you know how and just you look at the whole incident and you just say to yourself like mentally, like how did I get to that space? To make that decision, yeah, you know, at that point or, or any point in your life, and you don't have an answer for it, you know, it's just one of those things that it will, it will always, you know, sit in the back of your mind. Of, you know, why that decision, yeah, you know, that night during that time. I mean, I can understand, you know, everything that was behind it. I was, you know, I was, I had a hamstring. I was out like four or five weeks. They was yep. coming for the playoffs, and I was like, I never go out on Friday nights. Yeah. Yep. You know, I had never been out on a Friday night in my whole career. And That's wild. Never. The never, irony, never. right? And it was like, you know, so, so the world, hey, man, you got to come meet us at Fridays or whatever. Yep, like, yep. Out back. So Applebee's, out, so. out back. And, you know, I just made this decision to, you know, to carry my gun that night. Mm. And not not even having the slightest. No thoughts? Not, not even thinking about it because it was just something that, you know, I carried a gun in the off season. I mean, that was just, you know, uh you know, my mindset and where I was at. But that that I never forget that whole night of how that whole thing went down. So you and, don't, I don't know if you were I don't know if you had a clue. So I remember and so th- there was some distance in between when this happened, but I remember I think I a missed you. call and and I don't know if it was a day later or the or the same day and I'm like No, it was an, it was it was before we had went out. Boom. So then the news break, and I'm like, because I was bro, trying, to, like, I was trying to get everybody to come out to the spot. Boom! So I'm wondering when I missed this call because I'm like, then the news break. I'm like, man, I oh, man, man, maybe the only thing he called me for was a prayer because you know, like that's about the only thing I could have did. <laughs> <laughs> this was actually before I even got to the restaurant. Got you. Cause I wake, I literally, I must have had my phone gone somewhere, and I don't see that missed call to the next day, and then like the news, the news eventually catch up, and I'm like, oh, this is bananas. So I didn't know what time that missed call was, but I'm like, you know, it's, it's one of those things. Like I said, I've always because you get that. Like I said, when you the dude that's let's be like let's just be honest. I'm the holy dude in the locker room. I'm the dude that I I go out and eat and kick it with my teammates, right. but I ain't out there. Out there, out there, right, right? Right, right, right. But, you know, you can feel certain love from certain people who know you. Right. So that was when I say the mutual respect. I always got that love from you, and you're one of the best players on the team. I ain't always feel that love from everybody. Not that you need to have great relationships with every single player. So getting that missed call, I'm like, man, that was something that I always remember. Like, man, I hope everything, you know, of course everything was what it was. Who were the people, right? So I know everybody, different people play different roles, and you're going to have a lot of support because people were for you through that process. Who were some of the people that were integral to just really holding you down? Obviously your wife, but other people that really kept you together during that time in prison. I talked to you a couple times at least, yeah. but, you know, I, I always, you know, you tri- I, I had a guilt in my mind. Like, man, I hope this dude know how, how much, you know, it just is what it is. Man, it, it was so, like, my support system was so incredible. It was just... Overflowing of just everybody, yeah, uh, you know, being there and telling me that, you know, yo man, you are gonna fight through this, you are gonna get through this, you are gonna get back to doing what you love to do, you gonna be home with your family, and for you know, for every person that told me that, 
you know, because it, you know, man, listen, I had some rough, some rough nights. So that's what. That, tell me, tell me the one of the thoughts, yeah. one of the yeah. one of the I'm ugly like, thoughts. I'm like, man, you know, I was like, I'm, I'm never gonna play again. You know, I'll never get back to, you know, doing what I was doing. And I'm like, man, how can you just, you know, uh, you know, commit yourself to something your whole life and have something like this happen to you, and you just like take it all away. And I was like, man, nobody's going to give me an opportunity. Did you ever have the cycle of the blame game? I mean, like, because, you know, obviously people play their role, whether it's executing judgment, courts, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, but you're grown now. You kind of sound like you've come to terms, you've owned it. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, we know what we did is wrong, but we didn't yeah. know certain things. Mm -hmm. So how did you cipher through the blame game? And, you know, did you always, like, just come back to center? How did that work? I mean, the blame game was just, I think that was the most prevalent thing okay. right there because it, it was only myself. Gotcha. And I had to come to peace with that first. Like this is be, me. Before I could do anything else to try to move past that point because there was nobody there, there, there was nobody to blame but me. Everyone was talking about, oh, you know, they gave you, you know, hard sinners and Bloomberg and all these things. But if I didn't put myself in that situation, there you go. they wouldn't have acted in the way that they act. It's one of the biggest parts of my mindset and leadership and even how I felt like I was able to have opportunities as a player because yeah. if I didn't get opportunities, I would just blame it on me. I'm like, apparently I'm not that I'm not that persuasive, even if there was some politics involved with things of that nature. Yeah. So I that's thought, huge. Yeah, I think in the beginning, it was... It was it's tough. It, I, as time went on, and I mean, the outpouring of support I had, man, to my, you know, Magic Johnson and you know, you know Jamie Fox and you know uh, <laughs> you clearly Steve, on another level, yeah, bro. Steve, <laughs> I mean, Steve coming out, yeah. Straight, I mean, just everybody, the outpouring of support. And I, I think after I got to about a year into it, and I was like, you know what, I'm gonna make it through this. It's huge. And and I don't think if it wasn't for you know the support that Tony Dungy, I mean, just everybody was just so you know, supportive and telling me that it was going to be okay, at, even at times when I was like, man, I don't know if I'm going to make it. Yeah. And they pushed me through to the point to, to prove them right. It's excellent. That I could fight through it and get through it and, and end up on my feet. But, uh, and, but also on the flip side of that, I think the most important, you know, lesson that I learned was like, I learned who my real, like, friends were, even in my family. It's real. I learned that, and that was that was the, the most glaring thing about the whole thing. And I'm like, word, <laughs> they act yeah. like this, yeah, bro. That's when oh, the eyes got to get big and turn like, up. Oh man, like yo, know, I, I was paying your mortgage to keep you getting evicted. Yeah, when your water heater busted or whatever the, the case may be. Oh, um, I paid off your school loans and all oh, the like, go. Oh, I ain't heard from you and oh, word, that's you. It's crazy. And, but then at the same time, it, it, it calluses you a little bit and it makes your, makes your skin tougher. Yeah, because, absolutely. Because uh, you like, and my, my friends that I grew up with, like my five, six, seven, eight, man, they never flinched, man. It was like nothing had ever happened. That's huge. And that's, Loyal how, dogs. that's, and that's how you know. And he was like, you know what? Um, mom used to always say surround the people that say they love you, not just say they do. Uh, my boys, man, they didn't bug. Big shout, Miss Vicky. And they were just like, they were rock solid, man. That's huge, bro. Yo, so now we had 2011. Uh, you know, June, you, you're out. You, you, you know, you. this is your, this is, the moment's finally here, right? Mm -hmm. Now we have a month later, toward the end of July, you sign your contract with the New York Jets. October, bro. I mean, I mean, your your season. You you were making immediate impact, so it was clear you could play. But you actually have three touchdowns in one game. I believe it was against the Chargers. Mm -hmm. And you know, apparently that ends up to be in the season where also the New York Football Giants win the Super Bowl. So mm -hmm. I'm thinking about the emotions of what you just endured coming out of prison to having this climax climactic moment of returning putting that stamp of approval. So tell me what that year had to be like. And, and then watching, of course, the New York football giants who you had an opportunity to be with. Walk, walk Man, me through. It was, it was, it was, it was different because I, you know, we ended up playing the giants that year. 
Okay. And um, I never forget what the Bradshaw ran over top of Brandon Poole. Mm. And San Antonio looked at me. He was like, man, they're going to they win the Super Bowl. I said, man, they better not win, them, win it out without me. And he he said it. And he, he said it. it. He said that on the sideline. That's bad. And um, so I had a chance to go back to New York. And I was going to San Francisco. I had my mind bent on going to San Francisco. And I actually had the conversation with my wife. I said, what do you think about me going to California? And she was like, well, you know, I'm going to be working. The kids are going to be in school. Yeah. And, and you know, we going to come out as much as we possibly can. But I was like, you know, I need to be closer to the home. Yeah. Then I went to Pittsburgh. Mike T was like, we ain't letting you out the door. <laughs> <laughs> Like, he had eyes on you too. And then Ryan Clark and everybody came in. Hey man, you ain't leaving. I love it. So and then, make a long story short, I'm on my way to San Francisco, and I get off the plane, and I'm walking up the the uh, whatever they call that the, into the little, into the airport. Little ramp. The ramp. Okay. And my phone ring. It's Rex Ryan. Yeah, he say place is Rex. I was like, man, how the hell you get my number? <laughs> he said, like the IRS. He, he, I mean, said, FBI. he said, where you at? I said, I'm in San Jose on my way to San Francisco. He said, I heard you gonna sign with the Niners. I said, yeah. He said, don't do it. Uh, we gonna sign you. Come back to the Jets. And I was like, I don't know. He said, he said we got we got somebody waiting outside, right outside our front. Don't go downstairs to get your bags. So they had the airport. At the airport. Oh, that's so gangster. So I don't think I never ever told anybody this. So they told me don't go to baggage claim to get my bags. Somebody go to the upper level. They gonna meet me um, at the at the ticket encounter, and we gonna leave off of that level and go to the hotel. Well, what kind of secret service friggin'? Yeah, it did. And I, listen, and I you talking about burning the bridge? I never went down there to meet John Harborough. He was waiting for me to. So, he uh, waited for y'all to get off the plane he waited for me to get on. And I kind of made a decision. I said, you know what? You know, I can I can stay in my own home. Yeah. Yeah. And I can be close to my family. And me and my wife and I, man, we made that decision for me to be home, take less instead of me being, you know, way across the country. But to play that year, I, I laid the team in touchdowns. Yeah. And it, it was just a different you know, it was a different feel and an appreciation for the game. I'm something sure. Something that I just love to do. and But yet, to watch, uh, you know, the Giants win it, knowing that it was the first team that picked up the phone and called me and said they wanted me back, it's something that, I, that, that you know, so you what, always think about. What was, the main re- what was the main reason, you know, if any, where you felt like it's not I, a I, fit I, right now? I just think I needed something fresh. Okay. That's real. That was basically my whole set. Yeah. And I even talked to Sully about it. Yeah. And he was like, you know, you probably do. I'm not telling you what to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, you know everybody and, you know, you've been through so much. Um, But I made that decision basically based off of, you know, me being away, yeah. having a fresh start as far as with another organization. Yeah. And even though it wasn't the best business decision that I could have made yeah. during that time, taking less. You but, struggle but with one New York, you know, a yeah. little copper with that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I could, yeah, I could, I could have been on the other side of it, and then you know, you, you San know, Francisco that, might have been know. a better pick, but but nah, I, like I said, you look back at this thing in hindsight, it it, it was a beautiful, beautiful thing. Your priorities, one hundred percent, are totally different, man. So. Uh, it was it was special to watch, you know. My last season, like I said, I I had five in like robust seasons, and then it was injury and swan song. So it was, you know. But when I when I got my last season in with the Ravens, it was number seventeen because my dog was my dog was you know overcoming. Yeah. And you know, I wore seventeen in high school for for a couple of years too. So it it, it was sentimental because I just knew. That man, it's, it's a good dude that's overcoming, but I also knew on the other side of it, you was you were getting better. So, man, I just got so much respect for you, man. Talk about your transition out of the NFL. Did you have a plan? And you know, if 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 you didn't, what, what was that process like for you? What you learned about yourself, and ultimately move into what you're doing now? Um, I didn't have a plan. Real talk. 
I, I, most I, of us don't, but we don't want to say it exactly like that. I, I didn't have a plan. <laughs> I just knew that I didn't want to. Well, I didn't want to play football anymore, and my body was hurting. You had the rotator cuff injury, it, right? Yep. I'm saying to myself, you know what? I've, I've done just about everything in this business that I wanted to. And I was in Pittsburgh for my 13th season. And, you know, I fall. I tear my rotator cuff. And I'm like, you know what? I'm done. Mm. I told Mike I told Mike T and the training staff that, that afternoon. I was like, man, I'm not playing anymore. Mm-hmm. Because yeah, I got to the point in my mind to where – even 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 when I was with the Jets, you know, you sit you sit on that stool and you stand in that locker, yep. and the last thing that goes through your mind before taking the field, you say to yourself, "Man, I just want to walk off healthy today." Yeah, and true. once you and once you get in that mindset, it's time to let it go. Yeah, yeah, but, I got you. You know, luckily for me, I was at a place to where I had already won a championship, Special. and a lot of guys keep continue to play to further injure themselves. To get to that point to something that we had we had already accomplished. True. So I was a, I was at peace, even though you know I I had a career in the injury. I was at peace, you know, to be able to walk away from the game, even though I didn't have a plan. Yeah. And so, you know, you have to figure out what it is that makes you happy and what you're passionate about, mm-hmm. not just you know being forced into doing something. And, you know, I went to ESPN and, and I started doing TV. And then I started realizing how phony those people was, was behind the cameras. <laughs> and I was like, no, man, I'm just cussing somebody out and lay hands on somebody. So I'm going to go find something else to Lay do. hands incorporated, yeah, baby. You know, I'm going to go find something else to do. <laughs> lay hands incorporated, LLC. <laughs> and, yeah, man, just kind of just finding my niche. And I kind of came into this thing to where, you know, um, you know I wanted to. To own something, and I wanted to not just for myself, but teach my kids about ownership. Yes, and and how important it is. Like everything that I'm doing now, it's huge. It's just a jump start to really just put them in a place to before they can understand how important it is, and not just to see their father as just you know a football player, you know playing the Super Bowl, all of those things which are great, absolutely. But at the same time, them saying that okay. Uh, um, you know, my dad was able to walk away from football and, and, and to be a business owner. Yeah. And and that's something that I, I, I'm, I pride myself on. Yeah. Because I know that you know, my, my children are so gifted athletically that they're going to have an opportunity to go to college or whatever the case may be, God willing. Yeah. And But at the same time, understanding that, because when I came in, we thought we were going to be there forever. Bro, you already know. I mean, like, you know, and, and they, they already they already mentally try to prepare you like, hey, man, this ain't going to last forever. And different people have unique opportunities. Obviously, you had a freaking, uh, you know, a, a amazing career. But, you know, like that 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 progression of laying a foundation for your children. And like I said, I gave you kudos. I honestly thought because of your football IQ, I thought you were, you would consider coaching. So when you did the, 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 the spot with Arizona, I believe it was, yeah. I, I, I kind of saw that. So it caught me off guard when you kind of came back home, pivoted, and found your lane. Right now, I believe it's with the, uh, with the juice. Yeah. You, you, yeah. So talk about that a little bit. You know, like, I thought it was going to be ball. Was it too much for you? And what about mm-hmm. the business and, the, you know, the franchise and move, moved, moved you more? Uh, I think that um, I, I wanted to go into coaching. I thought that's how, you know what, there's some, you know, knowledge that I can give to these kids that nobody else is going to be able to give to them based off of, you know, um, you know my knowledge of the game and playing the game at such a high level to being able to give them some jewels that, that's going to help in detail. That's going to help improve them Absolutely. as young men and as football players. And the more and more I got into it, and I'm like, well, damn. Uh, <laughs> I'm working more now than when I was playing. Yeah, buddy. Uh, I ain't, seen my, wife. I ain't seen my wife in three weeks. This ain't going to work. This ain't going to work. And uh, just devoting so much time to it, waking up at five in the morning, getting there at six. It's a real picture. You know, uh, you know, position meeting, staff meeting. Practice meeting, meeting, practice meeting. This ain't this much damn football in the world. <laughs> and I'm mean, getting out to like ten at night, which I love the opportunity for me bringing me out there. But when I left, I was like exhausted. 
Yeah, but it, it, it's, it's not for me. Yeah, it was clear. Like what I, what I learned, it was, it, like I said, just from the outside, a couple conversations here and there. I'm like, this dude is really laying the foundation for a family. Like his, where you settled in that experience, have an opportunity to finish, came back home, breathe. Like this dude, I, I was like, because I'm so sure I'm like, oh, Plex in Arizona is about to go down. But left which out there, it's about to go down. But man, I, I, it was admirable because that's 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 kind of who I am. So talk about you know right now what you got going with with, with Nectar and some of the you know and I believe I, you got the podcast right? Yeah, yeah we had a podcast every Saturday up on Game on Fox Sports Radio. Myself, Lavar Arrington, T.J. Hudson, Zada Man, it's uh, it's really really you know doing well. And um, you know they actually actually picked up the phone and called me and asked me if I would do it. And I was like, you know, I'll give it a shot. And now here we are working on um, two and a half years going into three. Excellent. And um, it's, a, it's a great platform for us. But as far as me, like I said, getting into the, uh, you know, ownership part of it, uh, you know, a lot of, you know, uh, you know, I, I wanted to get into ownership. And just like you, I was all, you know, I was always, when I was playing, I was never like this big time pill taker. I was always, okay. you know, you know, into, you know, the, the, the gingers and the turmeric. Get your spices and vitamins, on. Vitamins. That's right. The, the salmon and the pecans, like the get, natural get anti-inflammatories the whole of just, you know, the body and not just, you know, shoving down, you know, Advils and Tylenol and all of those things. You'd be like, I can turn around and yeah. man, I left that narcotic alone now, and, man. Uh, hey, man, I followed <laughs> your footsteps and I, you know, I did my research. <laughs> I was proud of you, yeah, bro. Yeah, I mean, I, just I, from I, brother to brother. Yeah, I did my research, man, and I was like, you know what? This is something that I have no problem getting up in the morning and going to work and doing. Excellent. And that's when I knew, you know, it was for me. But at the same time, you know, uh, you know, you know, adding to your life, man, living a better life, living a healthier life. Excellent. For myself, my kids. There you go. And you know, in that aspect of it, but at the same time. You know, being able to teach them the business so they can yes. understand. My dad, I, can, uh, dad, when open, can I go to work? Absolutely. Uh, oh, absolutely. Well, absolutely. I'm going to oh, need oh, you. Oh, what you think? You thought I was going to ask you? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yes, sir. Yeah, man. Getting to that, uh, you know, it, it's the, the journey of it and the process. It, it's, it's it, ups it's, and downs, yeah, ebbs and flows, yeah, bro. It's not as, you know, smooth as I thought it was going to go, but you can now, you know, see the, the whole, you know, the transformation of just the process, you know, learning more about the business, yeah, understanding it, you know, uh, knowing what you can and can I do. And I haven't even opened a store yet, yeah, but I do, you know, you uh, guys like yourself, and uh, just reaching out to business owners is really just, you know, plucking their brains on different situations and and learning it. But I won't learn it basically until I get in there. It's gonna be real. But, uh, but you know what? You <laughs> built for it, though. Yeah, you know, built I, for it. it's something that I want to do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, and and at the end of the day, when we experience challenges, we don't buck. Yeah, right, you right, know, right. like we rise up. Yeah, yeah. So you know, man, you, you you've had the championship pedigree. Like I said, my my personal, I, I just know you're the most dominant guy. To actually, people don't understand what to not practice an entire almost entire season, to dominate, to miss football for two two full seasons, come back. And be one of the best receivers in the National Football League, you know. And I, I know you already talked about, you know. There's always random thoughts of what could have been, but I just want to assure you, bro, you're one of the most dominant of our era. One of one of my best friends, one of my favorite people in, in the world, man. So, thank you for being a, a champion on off the field. I look forward to seeing the foot, you know, the the the, the helmet catch football here on, uh, you know, <laughs> spending I'm, some time. I'm, I'm gonna bring it. <laughs> But I appreciate you for coming out, man. Your your story inspires, and I know you're still you, you're really just getting started. You, you know, it's almost like you know, ain't no halftime, but you're, you're building momentum and, and, and becoming a man, the 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 entrepreneur, the father, the husband that I know God's called for you to be, man. So kudos, and appreciate you for coming through, man. No, man, I appreciate it.